Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. The purpose of this channel is to help you to teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. This week, we're going to begin the actual text of the Book of Mormon with 1 Nephi, probably one of the most read books in the Book of Mormon. Because I know that a lot uh, get to the Isaiah chapters in 2 Nephi and, and stall a bit there. But don't worry, I'm going to help you through those chapters as well. But I imagine that most of us are familiar with the great story of Lehi and his family's travels to the Promised Land. And, and that's what we're going to begin to cover this week. Now remember, teachers, if you're interested in obtaining the handouts, slides, or lesson plans that I make to, to help teachers reduce their preparation time, and increase their confidence in the classroom. Just go to teachingwithpower.com and you're going to find links to my blog, uh, my Etsy shop, where those materials are available. And I also have subscriptions available on Etsy where you just make one purchase once and then I'll send you the materials for each lesson weekly in a shared Dropbox folder for the rest of the year. And I'll put links to all of this in the video description below. But uh, let's not waste any time and get right into the lesson for this week. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Now, for this week, there's an overall object lesson that I might use to introduce any or all of the lessons that I decide to teach that week. And that's to bring in a backpack. Any backpack is going to do, but I prefer to bring in a legitimate backpacking backpack. The kind that you would use if you were planning on going on a, a trip into the wilderness for a couple of nights. So I bring out my backpack and I explain to the class that whenever I go on a hike, I always make sure that I'm carrying what hikers call the 10 essentials. You don't want to go very far from a trailhead into the backcountry without at least packing these 10 things. And if you wanted to take this object lesson a step further, and if you have the items available, you could actually put examples of the 10 essentials in your backpack and then bring them out one by one as they're discussed. But I ask my students if they can name any of the 10 essentials. Do you know what they are? Well, number one, navigation. So a map, a compass, or even nowadays, a GPS-enabled device. Number two, illumination. A flashlight or a headlamp. You know, if you get into trouble, you never know if you're going to have to spend some time in the dark. I'd never go on a hike, even a short day hike, without a flashlight. Number three, water. Always got to make sure that you have plenty of water or a way to get water. Nowadays, I always bring a water filter when I go hiking. Number four, food. Granola bars, candy, a sandwich, beef jerky, calories to keep you going. Number five, first aid. Bad things can happen in the outdoors, so you've got to make sure that you're prepared for the most common types of injuries. Number six, shelter. I don't think you always have to carry a tent wherever you go, but I like to bring an emergency bivy sack, or at least one of those space blankets that could be used as protection from the elements if things turn bad. Number seven, fire, or a way to start fire, because fire can come in handy in a lot of different ways in the outdoors. Warmth, light, protection from wild animals, signaling, purifying water, cooking food. I always like to have a couple of different ways to start a fire. Number eight, insulation. It's always good to bring a jacket, even when it's warm out. You never know when the temperatures might drop. Even if it's the middle of summer, I always bring a jacket because if you get wet or rained on and then it gets windy, you can get cold really fast. Number nine, a knife or some kind of multi-tool. A knife can come in handy for all kinds of things in the outdoors. And then number 10, one that's often overlooked, sun protection. Sun can do a number on you if you're not prepared for it, especially if you like to hike in the desert like I do. So a hat, sunglasses, and sunscreen can be, can be important. Now, obviously, there are other things that you'd want to consider bringing with you into the outdoors, but these 10 stand out as the most critical. I wouldn't want to go on any hike without them. 
Well, you may know that the Book of Mormon begins with a camping trip of sorts, doesn't it? It recounts one family's journey through the wilderness. And it's quite the adventure. It stands as one of the great journey narratives in the scriptures. Can you name any of the others? Now, we've got the Exodus of the Old Testament. Uh, the journey to the promised land made by the Jaredites, which we're going to study later this year in Ether. Uh, and then the journey across the American West of the early pioneers. And there are other smaller journeys as well. But I found the best way to make these stories more relevant is to compare their journey to their promised land, their destination, with our journey to our promised land. Celestial kingdom, eternal life. Life is like a wilderness. It's a pretty fitting symbol, isn't it? It's a journey fraught with dangers and pitfalls, but also beautiful vistas and powerful experiences. It's not a hopeless endeavor. And it doesn't have to be a miserable one either. I'm a backpacker and I love the wilderness. And setting out into it doesn't have to be a scary, terrible thing. If you have the right attitude, the right gear, and you're prepared, it can be an incredibly challenging but fulfilling experience. Members of Lehi's family are going to show us the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. We've got examples of both in 1 Nephi. So we can follow their positive examples and learn from their mistakes. This week, we're going to do three different lessons that will illustrate three different essentials that everyone should be packing in their spiritual backpack through the wilderness of life. And teachers, you may not have time to do all three, depending on your teaching situation, but you could still use the backpack metaphor for any or all of these. So lesson number one, a pattern for personal revelation. Now, the backpack activity could serve as your icebreaker for any of these three lessons, and then you could just jump right into the text. But I'm going to also provide you with one additional icebreaker activity or idea for each of the individual lessons as well, if you're interested. Our first lesson is going to come from 1 Nephi chapters 1 and 2. And to introduce it, you could give your students this pattern recognition challenge. Can you identify what comes next in this sequence of numbers? What's the pattern? You might even want to hit pause and see if you can figure it out. Here is the explanation. The answer is one, three, one, one, two, 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 one. This is a hard one. I know it is. Uh, why is that the answer? Because each succeeding line is describing the line before it. So you start with the number one. How would you describe that? Well, there's one, one. So I write that down. Now, how would I describe that number? Well, there are two ones. So I write two, one in the next line. And then next, there's one, two, and one, one. Then one one, one two, two ones. Then three ones, two twos, one ones, which then leaves us with our answer. One three, one one, two two, two ones. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Well, sometimes we're going to find patterns and sequences in the scriptures as well. And first Nephi chapter one starts out with a really important one, perhaps one of the most important ones in the scriptures. On the surface, 1 Nephi chapter 1 appears to be just a very simple story. But upon closer examination, you may come to the conclusion that I've come to that it wasn't a coincidence that this was included as the first story in the Book of Mormon. And I would label this chapter a pattern for personal revelation and write that at the top of page 1 or 2 as a label. And then I'd mark the steps in one specific color throughout the chapter. 
So take a look at the following verses and see if you can identify a sequence of steps in the process of receiving revelation from God. 1, 4 for step 1, 1, 5 for step 2, and then 1, 6, 1, 12, and 1, 19 for the rest of the steps. And the first step in verse 4 that I see is where Lehi hears many prophets prophesy that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And I'd call this step introduction or an initial contact with God's word and will. This is how God works with the children of men. He always sends prophets to teach, instruct, and warn. Yes, you know, he loves to have us learn to recognize the still small voice of the Spirit guiding us. But he also understands that sometimes we need a clear, audible, unmistakable voice revealing God's will and instruction. That voice comes from his prophets. And the specific warning here is of destruction. Repent, people of Jerusalem, or you're going to be destroyed. Interesting that the Book of Mormon begins and ends with the destruction of a people. Maybe we ought to keep our eyes out uh, uh, for things that are going to lead peoples and nations to destruction and take note so that we don't fall into the same trap. When Lehi hears that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, what's the very next thing we see him doing? Step two in verse five. He prays with all of his heart. So sincerity is is key here in that prayer. And, And that step I would call invocation. Lehi wants to know for himself from God that the words he's hearing are true. And then what happens as a result of this prayer? The next step is in verse 6. Verse tells us that he saw and heard much. God answers Lehi's prayer, gives him the revelation that he's seeking. And that third step I would call illumination. God illuminates or enlightens Lehi because of his willingness to seek wisdom. And then the next step goes hand in hand with this last one because They're often simultaneous. But what happens to Lehi in verse 12? As God grants him wisdom, he's filled with the Spirit. And I call this step confirmation. The Spirit confirms what's being revealed. So I would say that illumination and confirmation often go hand in hand. And finally, after Lehi has discovered the truth and had it confirmed, what does he do next? See if you can catch the key word in verse 19. And it came to pass that the Jews did mock him because of the things which he testified of them. For he truly testified of their wickedness and their abominations. And he testified that the things which he saw and heard, and also the things which he read in the book, manifested plainly of the coming of a Messiah, and also the redemption of the world. So did you catch our key word? testify. Once he knows the truth, he declares and testifies of that truth to other people. And I would call that step declaration. Because of Lehi's declaration, there's another key figure in the Book of Mormon that's going to be touched by that declaration, his son Nephi. And in the succeeding chapters, we're going to watch Nephi go through the exact same pattern works in a circular fashion, as one person's experience with the pattern leads them to testify to others. Others then work through the same steps as the first. And let me just walk you through uh, Nephi's pattern so that you can see this. In chapter 1, verse 16, we see that Lehi prophesies and speaks unto his children. So Nephi is going to hear the words of Lehi. Then in chapter 2, verse 16, we see this. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, being exceedingly young, nevertheless being large in stature, and also having great desires to know of the mysteries of God. Wherefore, I did cry unto the Lord. And behold, he did visit me, and did soften my heart, 
that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. Wherefore, I did not rebel against him like unto my brothers. So we've got step two in there. He prays. And then as a result of that prayer, we see the Lord answer Nephi there in verse 16, but also in verses 19 through 24. He too sees and hears much. And we, we see a description of the confirmation of the Spirit in verse 17, where Nephi says that the Lord had manifested unto him by his Holy Spirit. And then what does Nephi do? Also in verse 17, he speaks unto Sam, his brother. He testifies of what he's seen, and we can surmise that Sam is going to go through the same process himself as a result of Nephi and his father's testifying, because he too is going to follow. And there are many other examples of this pattern throughout this story, and indeed throughout the entire Book of Mormon. We're going to see it again when Lehi has his vision of the Tree of Life. We're going to see it in the story of Enos and Alma and Alma the Younger and Amulek, King Lamoni and his family and the brother of Jared and many, many other times all throughout the Book of Mormon. Therefore, to liken the scriptures, what is one of the most important things that we can pack in our spiritual backpacks? Personal revelation. An understanding of this pattern and a willingness to apply it. God speaks to man. He, he wants to speak to us. And at that point, I might pull out a sign or a symbol that represents personal revelation and put it into the backpack. A light bulb might be a good idea for this. Truth, then, here for this first lesson. When prophets testify, if I pray with sincerity for confirmation of the truth, I will see and hear much. Then I must go out and testify of what I've seen and heard. You might consider showing the following video, which perfectly mirrors and explains in greater detail uh, the pattern that 1 Nephi chapter 1 has just shown us. And while they watch, I would invite them to look for all the different ways in which God can confirm truth to us by the Spirit. There's, there's a lot of different ways that we, we can hear and see much. What are those things as you watch the video? And a, a great quote that you might share here from President Nelson. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ about your concerns, your fears, your weaknesses. Yes, the very longings of your heart. And then listen. Write the thoughts that come to your mind. Record your feelings and follow through with actions that you are prompted to take. As you repeat this process day after day, month after month, year after year, you will grow into the principle of revelation. To take this message to heart, have you ever seen this pattern fulfilled in your own life? You could encourage your students to share their experiences with the class. And you know, isn't that interesting that the very first story of the Book of Mormon is about a man who hears the words of the prophets, prays to understand them, has his prayer answered, and then testifies of it to other people. Because that's exactly what we're meant to do with the Book of Mormon ourselves. This year, that's what we're going to experience. We're going to hear the words of prophets in these sacred pages. We're going to hear their warnings, calls to action. Therefore, what should we do when we come in contact with these words of the prophets? Do what Lehi did. Pray about them and ask for guidance. We don't, we don't need to just wait until we've finished studying the Book of Mormon to pray about its truthfulness. It's not just something we do once we've finished reading Moroni chapter 10. We do it all along the way. The illumination, the confirmation is going to come throughout our study, not just once at the end. 
And if we approach our study that way, with this pattern firmly placed in our backpacks, then, then we too are going to come to see and hear much. It may not come in the form of a pillar of fire or heavenly visions, but it's going to come. God's light and power are going to be made manifest to us, and he will confirm the message by filling our souls with the Spirit. But then what's next? We don't want to forget that last step. Once we've had its truthfulness confirmed, let's go out and share it with others. In fact, that may be a prerequisite to receiving an answer in the first place, a willingness to act on the confirmation that we're requesting. Got to testify and declare our faith once we've found it out for ourselves. And one additional quick insight. Don't you just love the way that God reveals the truth to Lehi? Go to verses 11 through 12 for this. He doesn't have it announced by an angel. It's not even proclaimed by the voice of God himself. You see how he does it? And they came down and went forth upon the face of the earth. And the first came and stood before my father, it's Jesus, and gave unto him a book and bade him that he should read. And it came to pass that as he read, he was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. So Jesus walks over to Lehi and hands him a book and says, read this. And as Lehi reads, he's filled with the Spirit. I believe that that is the exact situation that we're all in as students of the Book of Mormon at this moment. We too are seeking divine help and wisdom from God. How is he answering us? His son, Jesus Christ, is handing us a book and saying, read this. That book is the Book of Mormon. Now You look at that, and do you think it's a coincidence that this is the first story and in the first chapter of the Book of Mormon? I don't think it is. So for our I will go and do, I'd like to offer you a challenge. Will you apply this pattern in your study of the Book of Mormon this year? Will you listen carefully to the words of the prophets found within the scriptures? Are you willing to pray for confirmation? And if you do, or if you have received that confirmation already, are you willing to go out and testify to others? And I want you to know that I have personally applied this pattern myself. I've studied the Book of Mormon. I've prayed about it many times. Because of those petitions, I can truthfully assure you that I have seen and heard much. I've felt things. I've been inspired and enlightened. I've seen miracles come into my life because of the teachings of the Book of Mormon. When I apply its principles, I'm blessed. And now, I really appreciate you, listener, <laughs> allowing me to share some of those things with you. To, to have an opportunity to fulfill that final step by testifying of my experiences with this phenomenal book of Scripture. The pattern is being applied right now, in this instant. So, just like Lehi and Nephi, let's pack the pattern of personal revelation in our spiritual backpacks this year. All right, now the second spiritual essential that we should pack with us on our journey through the wilderness of life. Lesson number two, the worth of the word. The object that I would have for this part of the lesson uh, maybe have some money at the front of your class. Uh, maybe a, a $100 bill, if you can secure one, uh, or even just a couple of ones would do the trick. But have that money prominently displayed at the front of the classroom, and you tell your students that today we're going to talk about the value of things. The process of determining the worth of something 
can be a little intimidating and tricky. I know that when I've tried to sell things on eBay or Craigslist or even a garage sale, sometimes I get it wrong. The value that I think something holds may not be how everybody else perceives it or values it. So we're going to practice that skill today. We're going to try to hone our ability to determine worth. For an icebreaker, I like to play a very brief version of The Price is Right with my students. So I randomly select a student to come to the front to play the game. You know, with the whole, come on down, you're the next contestant on The Price is Right. I even have the theme music playing in the background. But you tell them that in this game, you're going to present them with an object. But the price displayed for it is incorrect. Each number in the price is off by one. And they're going to have to decide for each number whether it should be changed to the number higher or the number lower than the one displayed. So, for example, if the item is this Big Mac meal and it says that it costs eight ninety one, that's incorrect. Should that eight actually be a seven or a nine? And the 9, is that an 8 or a 0? And then, is the 1 a 0 or a 2? They're going to make their guess, and if they get it right, they win a treat. But if they get it wrong, you tell them how many of the numbers they guessed wrong, but not which ones. And you give them one more chance to change something. So, the actual retail price of the Big Mac meal is 982 which i know it, it could be different in other places I, I tried to do the best research i could and for my area uh that's what it is but it doesn't matter they're they're just going to guess and play the game anyway and did you get that right now let's try another one a 128 gigabyte iphone 15 608 dollars is displayed is that six a five or a seven is the 0 a 1 or a 9? And is that 8 a 7 or a 9? The actual retail price of the iPhone 15 is $799. Finally, a Nintendo Switch video game console. What do you think the price would be? Price displayed is $380. Is the 3 a 4 or a 2? Is the 8 a 9 or a 7? And the 0 a 1 or a 9? Well, the actual retail price, $299. Anyway, you can have some fun with that one. But the next item you display is where the lesson kind of takes a bit of a turn. You'll display a picture of the scriptures. What are they worth? How would you answer that question? I love that in early church history, Joseph Smith invited the brethren to take a vote as to the value of the revelations that are found in the Doctrine and Covenants. And their conclusion? The conference voted that they prized the revelations to be worth to the church the riches of the whole earth, speaking temporally. And I love the formality of that. Right, uh, we, we voted and we've concluded that they're worth all the money in the whole world. <laughs> but the big question of this lesson is going to be, what are the scriptures worth to you? First Nephi chapters 3 through 5 are going to help us to determine the value of the scriptures, the worth of the word. So for a search activity, we're going to do a secret phrase handout. Have your students work as partners or on this individually and challenge them to be the first to fill out all the words by studying the provided references and then trying to unscramble the letters to those words. Then you're going to use those letters to determine the secret phrase at the bottom. The big question, of course, what are the scriptures worth? And as you correct the handout, encourage them to make a label at the top of page five and to choose a color to mark the scripture's answer to that question. So the first one here is found in chapter 2, verse 6, and chapter 3, verse 2. 
Chapter 2, verse 6 reveals that they've traveled, family, three days into the wilderness. And then chapter 3, verse 2 has Lehi telling them to go back. So what would the boys need to sacrifice in order to get the plates? That's six days of travel to and from Jerusalem. So what are the scriptures apparently worth? Six days of travel or a long journey is the answer there. That's the word I'd put there. Number two, in 1 Nephi 3, 22 through 24, what apparently were the scriptures worth to them based on these verses? All their gold, silver, and precious things. They were worth all of their worldly wealth. They give it up for the scriptures. Now we know that it doesn't work. Laban just takes their money, but they're still willing to give it. So the answer here is all of their temporal, precious things. Number three, verse Nephi 3, 13 and 3, 25. And this one may be just a little bit harder to identify. But what happened in both of their first attempts to get the plates? It says that Laban sought to slay them. So what are they apparently willing to give or risk in order to obtain the plates? Their lives. Scriptures are worth risking your lives for. We've got plenty of examples of people who were willing to actually risk or even give their lives for the word. People like Abinadi, Moroni, Samuel the Lamanite, Jesus, all of the early apostles, William Tyndale, and Joseph and Hiram. I like something that the Doctrine and Covenants says about the value of the Book of Mormon, that it cost the best blood of the 19th century. Quite a cost. And number four and number five come from 1 Nephi chapter 4, verses 10 through 18. Two answers here. One, they were apparently worth the life of a wicked man. Uh, Laban's life was taken in order for Nephi to get the plates. And that shouldn't be taken lightly. Uh, we know how much God values life. So for him to ask Nephi to do this must have been something that God knew was necessary for Nephi to do in order for him to be able to obtain the plates. Because why else would he have him do this? And there is another answer here. Uh, this is the only place in the account of Nephi where you see him shrink from a commandment of the Lord. Everywhere else in the story, Nephi is an, I will go and do, I must obey. If God commanded me to say unto this water, be thou earth, it would be done, kind of disciple. But here he shrinks. Shows you just how hard this must have been for Nephi. So what were the scriptures worth to him? Doing the most difficult thing you've ever done. Difficult is the answer there. All of that now, what's our secret phrase? Well, it's a quote from Elder Tad R. Callister. The Book of Mormon is one of God's priceless gifts to us. The story of retrieving the brass plates from Laban testify of that value and the worth of the word. For a video in this part of the lesson, you may be aware that the church recently produced Book of Mormon videos dramatizing certain events and stories from the scriptures. You might consider showing a portion of the following video to highlight a certain aspect of this story of obtaining the brass plates. Now, I probably wouldn't show the entire thing because it's like 30 minutes long. But maybe a small portion of it. Um, uh, the ending of the story, maybe, where the boys return and the family talks about the worth of the scriptures to them. It's an idea. Now, there are other verses of scriptures in these chapters that teach us the worth of the word. Invite your students to examine the following verses and see if they can find more reasons for why the scriptures are so valuable. And mark them in that same worth of the word color. First Nephi 3.20, they preserve the words of the prophets. 
Prophet's words are not things that we want to lose or spoil. We want to preserve them and remember them. Back in Adam's day, they didn't even call them scriptures. They called them book of remembrance. See that in Moses 6. Maybe we should start calling them that instead of scriptures. Might help us to value them even more. Chapter 1, verses 4, 2 through 3. And I love this. Where did Nephi draw strength and faith in order to head back into Jerusalem for the plates? After he's almost lost his life trying to get them. The scriptures. He finds strength in the story of Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. So he says, let us be strong like unto Moses. And the Lord is able to deliver us even as our fathers. So if God can help them, he can help us. Nephi was somebody who knew the value of likening the scriptures unto ourselves. 1 Nephi 4, 15 through 16. Nephi says that they could not keep the commandments of the Lord according to the law of Moses, save they should have the law. Scriptures teach us the commandments and what's right and wrong. 1 Nephi 5, 17. They fill us with the Spirit. 1 Nephi 5, 21 through 22. And, and these probably are some of the best verses of the entire lesson uh, and a great way to drive the message of the worth of the word deep into our hearts. And we had obtained the records which the Lord had commanded us and searched them. Such a good word for how we should interact with the scriptures. Go read them, search them. And found that they were desirable, yea, even of great worth unto us insomuch that we could preserve the commandments of the Lord unto our children. Wherefore, it was wisdom in the Lord that we should carry them with us as we journeyed in the wilderness towards the land of promise. So, our truth, the scriptures are of great worth. It is wisdom that we should carry them with us and search them in our journey of life. Now, to liken the scriptures, we've just seen what Nephi and his brothers were willing to sacrifice or give up in order for the scriptures. So I would ask, what has God asked us to give up in order to have the power of the scriptures in our lives? And I would answer that by saying, not much, right? 10 to 20 minutes of our time each day. If we want a copy of the Book of Mormon, we can simply run over to Deseret Book or search online and buy a set for a small fee. Or even more, we could just go online to the Gospel Library app and have them for free. In comparison to Nephi, Sam, Laman and Lemuel, or Abinadi, Joseph Smith, William Tyndale, God requires very little of us to enjoy the value of his word. And that because of his graciousness, love, and concern for our spiritual welfare. I believe that he understands how necessary they are for our spiritual survival in the spiritually perilous conditions of the last days. So he's made them incredibly accessible to us. When we consider what Nephi gave to have the scriptures, our excuses for not studying them, searching them, appear rather weak, I'm afraid. I mean, can you imagine at the judgment, Jesus walking over and asking us, did you value my word? And maybe we would start to give our excuses. Well, you know, Jesus, uh, yeah, life is rather busy, you know, and, and the scriptures were a little difficult for me to understand. And sometimes they just weren't, I'm afraid, as entertaining as other things. And while we were explaining, maybe Jesus would reach out his hand and just say, hold on, just one second before you continue. Nephi, come over here for a second, please. And all of a sudden, here comes Nephi walking over to us. And Jesus says to him, Hey, will you just stand there for a second for me? Thank you. And then he turns back to us and says, Now, you were saying? And knowing what we know Nephi went through for the scriptures, are we going to feel comfortable with our excuses in that setting? Probably not. So let's be sure to determine the proper value on our scriptures. 
take it to heart. What value have you found in the scriptures? I will go and do. What can you do to show that you understand the worth of God's word? And my suggestion would be study them, search them, take that little bit of time every day. Show your heavenly father that you value his words by feasting on them, loving them, sharing them and testify of them. And I don't think I have to convince you of, of how I feel about the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, they are so amazing. And I feel incredibly fortunate that I get to study and teach from them almost every day. I've been doing it for a long time now, and it's never gotten old. And I believe that every religion has something that they can teach us. And, and we could all afford to have a little more holy envy for the strengths that are demonstrated in other faiths. One of the things that I love most about the Jews is their incredible love and respect for Scripture. I've been to Israel, and I've seen the way that the rabbis carefully remove the Torah scrolls from their cases. And then they walk slowly with them, cradling them in their arms like a small child. Then they gently unroll and read from them with great reverence and respect on their lips. So much love and affection for the Word of God. And that's for books like Deuteronomy and Numbers. Do we feel the same kind of respect for books like Alma, the Gospel of John, Section 76, the Book of Abraham? Does it equal their respect and love for the Torah? There's even a special ceremony and a kind of funeral that the Jews hold when a Torah is considered to be too old and needs to be retired. They take it and they bury it almost as if it were a person. And then do you know what a bar or a bat mitzvah is? It's a rite of passage for Jewish boys and girls into adulthood. And what do they do to show that they are now men or women? They get the privilege of reading the scriptures in public. I think we would do well to learn from their examples. Do we value and love the scriptures as much as they do? I pray that we will recognize the worth of the word. That's the second thing that I would want to make sure I had packed in my spiritual backpack. It is wisdom in the Lord that we should carry them with us as we journey in the wilderness towards our land of promise. And at that point, I would take out a copy of the scriptures and place them in the backpack at the front of the room. A quick heads up here, there's still a lot more that the book of 1 Nephi has to teach us about the role of the scriptures in our lives. Now, we've still got the iron rod to talk about, and the liahona, and other great teachings that we'll do in future lessons. So stay tuned. The worth of the word is a major theme of the entire book of 1 Nephi. All right, our final lesson, lesson number three, Nephi versus Laman. Our object here, I would bring out an apple and an orange. And for an icebreaker to our last lesson, you pull out the apple and the orange and you ask, what do these two objects have in common? Now, well, they're both edible. They're both fruit. And they're both considered to be healthy. But in what ways do they differ? One is red, the other is orange, obviously. Uh, one has an edible peel, the other does not. Now, this simple little activity is an illustration of the skill of comparing and contrasting. And it's a vital skill to have when we study the scriptures. Very often, the scriptures are going to present us with two contrasting characters or principles or actions and invite us to compare them in literature this device is sometimes called foils or foil characters. And when we compare them, the qualities of those characters are augmented by juxtaposing them with each other. And we're going to see that again this year with King Noah versus Abinadi. 
Alma versus Korahor, Amalekiah versus Captain Moroni. But here in 1 Nephi, who are going to be our major foil characters to examine? You guessed it, Nephi versus Laman. Now, you could also do an interesting character study by comparing Sam with Lemuel, too. You've got those who lead for good or evil, and you have those who follow the influence of those that are good or evil. But for time's sake, we're just going to focus here on Nephi and Laban. Now, I hope you're okay with this, but this portion of the lesson is going to expand far beyond just chapters 1 through 5. To really see the full message of this comparison, I think we need to examine it from beginning to end. And I hope that you know it's okay to do that as a teacher sometimes. We don't always need to feel bound by the way that the manual breaks certain lessons up. There's great value in stepping back on occasion and looking for big picture principles. This is one of those kinds of lessons. And you could do this lesson anytime throughout your study of First Nephi or the way you teach the book of First Nephi. But it is a lesson I think should be taught at some point. We're going to look at these two brothers from the beginning of 1 Nephi all the way to the beginning of 2 Nephi, because I think most of us are familiar with how this story ends. The family is going to split, right? And we're going to end up with Nephites and Lamanites all throughout the rest of the Book of Mormon. But how did that happen? At the beginning of the story, I don't think Nephi and Laman are really that far apart in character as we might imagine. If they'd not been given the commandment to leave Jerusalem, at least in the beginning, the distance between their commitment or their spirituality would not be as far away from each other as they're eventually going to become. But as challenge after challenge comes to these two brothers, they begin to separate. They drift further and further apart in a step-by-step -step progression or regression. Laman and Nephi may have wound up worlds apart from each other in spirituality, but I don't believe they started out that way. And in order to really see how that process took place, we're going to do the following study activity. I call this rewards and rebukes. I've highlighted nine separate challenges that both Nephi and Laman face in the story of the family's journey to the promised land. And I want you to go through the following sets of verses and see how each responded to that challenge. And what was the result, reward, or rebuke to that response? And I, I know that this looks like a lot, and it is, it does take some time, but I think that the investment is going to be worth it. It's going to help us to look at the story as a whole rather than just in chunks and pieces. And for this activity, I'm not going to read each individual reference word for word. That would probably take too much time here. But I do encourage you to look them up on your own and become familiar with them as a teacher. And you may even want to mark them in two separate colors. That's what I've done. I have my Nephi color and my Laman color. And there are two suggestions that I have for teaching this. One, you could give your students time to go through and try to fill it out on their own but that would take some significant time. Or this may just be a time where you walk through the scriptures together and fill it out together as a class, summarizing and asking your class if they remember what happens in each part of the story. So here we go. What was the first challenge that Nephi and Laman face? Leaving Jerusalem. When Lehi comes and tells the family that they're, that they're going to leave, Nephi doesn't just take Lehi's word for it. We don't hear an I will go and do from Nephi just yet. The scriptures seem to suggest that he too struggled with the decision to leave Jerusalem. But the difference is that he has great desires to know the mysteries of God. So he prays. And what's the reward for that? The Lord answers his prayer and softens his heart. Laman, on the other hand, it says he knew not the dealings of God. He didn't have any desire to know the things of God. Therefore, he murmurs and doesn't believe in the words of his father. And that attitude is what I would call apathy. I've seen it in students before. They're not bad kids. 
They just don't care about spiritual things. And this story stands as a great caution to people with apathy towards spiritual things. I think that's where Laman first goes wrong. And it's just going to go downhill from there. And what's the result of that apathy and murmuring? He's rebuked and confounded by Nephi. And that rebuke does seem to work in this case. Laman complies and stops murmuring for the time being. And then we have the next challenge. Go back to Jerusalem for the plates. What's Nephi's response? Probably the most famous verse in all of 1 Nephi. I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. Now, I know that we almost always quote that verse as a great example of obedience, which it is. But I think it's a scripture even more about faith and trust in God. I'm sure that Nephi has no idea how they're going to be able to do what's been asked. It doesn't matter. He knows something about being asked by God to do something. That if God asks, you can do it. The ability is inherent in the command. And you might want to pause here and have a short like in the scriptures moment. Because God asks us to do hard things too, doesn't he? That's what Laman and Lemuel say. It's a hard thing you've asked of us. So what's a hard thing that God has asked of you? Maybe it's a commandment. Pay tithing in difficult financial circumstances. Forgive somebody that's hurt you deeply. Stay morally clean in, in an immoral world. Serve in a challenging calling. Tell the truth when it's not to your advantage. Serve a full-time mission. God does not shy away from asking us to do hard things. But we can remember Nephi. If God asks us to do it, what do we know? We can do it. God always prepares a way for us to do the thing he commands us. Because if we couldn't do it, he wouldn't ask us to do it in the first place. And what's the result or the reward for having that kind of an I will go and do attitude? Lehi tells him that he is favored and blessed of the Lord. So will we. If I obey God's commands, no matter how hard they seem, I will be favored and blessed. Laman, on the other hand, who says it's a hard thing, is more than likely rebuked again by Lehi. But there's no record of a specific rebuke. We may just have to guess at that one. But in any case, Laman does end up going back to Jerusalem with Nephi and the others. But when they get there, their first attempt to retrieve the plates ends in a miserable failure. Laban refuses, threatens to have Laman killed. And how does he react to that? He's ready to give up. It's like he says, well, we tried. Didn't work. Let's go home. And who has to straighten him out this time? Nephi does his little brother nephi says no we're not going to go back we are going to accomplish this and we know that because of this faith of his eventually he is going to succeed in getting the plates therefore nephi gets an idea hey we had all those riches we left behind let's try to purchase the plates how does that go even worse right it doesn't work they're obliged to leave all their riches behind and run for their lives and how does Laman react to that? He gets angry, starts to beat Nephi with a rod. And who has to intervene and rebuke them this time? An angel. An angel rebukes them and stops the beating. What's Nephi's attitude? I'm going to go back and we're going to accomplish this. Their first two ideas didn't work, so this time he's just going to go in and rely on the Spirit, not knowing beforehand what he's supposed to do total faith. And we know what happens. He sneaks back into the city, following the spirit, finds Laban, kills him, dresses up in his clothes, and manages to retrieve the plates from Zor. Because of his faith in God, he does accomplish the thing which the Lord commanded him. It worked. His faith was not vain. And I feel there's an important principle here too. This might be another moment to pause and liken the scriptures. What is this story so far? teach us about the things that God commands us to do. Is it always going to be easy? No, oh, there are challenges to obeying. Do we ever get the same 
layman attitude when we seek to obey. We're only willing to give it one try. As soon as we run into any kind of opposition, we're ready to throw in the towel. I'd say things like, hey, I tried to do the right thing, and look what happened. If God really wanted me to follow this commandment, he should have made it easy for me. For example, do we want to give up on our mission when we discover that it's actually quite hard work? Are we ready to abandon the law of tithing when we pay in faith and then still experience financial troubles anyway? Are we ready to give up on our marriage when we discover that it's actually quite challenging to bring two people from different lives together as one? God never promises us ease when it comes to obedience. We're going to find obstacles to obedience. Well, I always think it's funny that when Laman is asked to go back for the plates, he throws a fit. But when he's asked to go back for girls, there's no mention of any murmuring or rebelling of any kind. Go figure. And are we, too, sometimes more interested in romance than righteousness? But they do retrieve Ishmael's family. And on the way back, we have another challenge. Two of Ishmael's sons and two of his daughters rebel against Nephi. Hmm, I wonder which of Ishmael's daughters are going to end up with Laman and Lemuel. Sounds like we got a match here. And they get so angry with Nephi that they bind him with cords and they're going to leave him in the wilderness to die. But what does Nephi do? He prays for strength and bursts the bonds. Does that stop Laman? Nope. He starts to go after Nephi again. When who intervenes? One of Ishmael's daughters. I see another match developing here. She pleads with Laman and Lemuel not to hurt him. And it works. The pleadings of who I'm going to call the future Miss Nephi softens their hearts and they repent of their desires. It's interesting. Come back to that. The next challenge. Ishmael dies. Major crisis for the family. And how does Laman react? You guessed it. More murmuring, more anger, and a plan to kill both Lehi and Nephi. And who steps in to help this time? The voice of the Lord himself. It comes and chastens them exceedingly, and they repent and give up their plan. Nephi, on the other hand, has such a great attitude towards the difficulties of living in the wilderness. Chapter 17, verse 2. Really love this. And so great were the blessings of the Lord upon us that while we did live upon raw meat in the wilderness, our women did give plenty of suck for their children and were strong, yea, even like unto the men. And they began to bear their journeyings without murmurings. So just look at that attitude. What, what's Nephi grateful for? Raw meat and manly women. <laughs> look how blessed we are. We get to eat raw meat and it doesn't make us sick. How awesome. Our women may look like men, but... Hey, they're tough, and they can handle this difficult journey even when they're nursing. And because of that great attitude, in the next verse, it says that God nourishes and strengthens them. Now, you might have noticed that I skipped the story of the broken bow, which we definitely could include here. But I'm going to do something special for that one in another video. The next challenge, building the boat. God commands the family to do something that they have no experience with. And what are the first words out of Nephi's mouth? Where can I find ore to make tools? There's no question in Nephi's mind that he can do it. He just needs some help from God to get started. And he has complete faith that they're going to be able to make it happen. And what's the result of that faith? He does build a boat, and the workmanship is exceedingly fine. What about Laman? He complains. He won't help. Doesn't believe that it can be done. So what happens to him this time? He's rebuked by Nephi, but in a different way. He's shocked by the power of God. Laman physically feels that power this time. That changes his heart, and he helps to build the ship. Unfortunately, that change of heart is short-lived. Once on the ship, we know that Laman begins to speak with rudeness, and Nephi seeks to correct that. Laman gets angry, ties Nephi to the mast. What's Nephi's attitude in this affliction? He doesn't complain, even though he's in incredible pain. And Laman won't let him go until he realizes that the boat is about to sink, and he and everyone else in the boat is going to die. So Laman's very life is in danger now. 
It's the only thing that can convince him to change. Therefore, he lets Nephi go, and Nephi is able to rescue the family. Storm ceases. He sails them successfully to the promised land. And now our final challenge. What's going to happen when Lehi dies? Who's going to be in charge? Laman, of course, thinks it should be him. But everyone else knows that Nephi is the more deserving and better leader. So when Lehi dies, Laman gets angry again, seeks to take Nephi's life. And Nephi and those that wish to follow him flee. The family splits in two. And this time, there is no rebuke. The Lord resigns them to their wickedness. And they're cut off from his presence. Nephi, on the other hand, leads in righteousness and obedience. And his reward? They live after the manner of happiness. Now, as we reflect back on that entire account, did anything stand out to you? Do you see any truths that are taught by comparing Nephi's experiences with Laman's? You could just let your class share their thoughts on that. One thing that I noticed, every time Nephi obeys or demonstrates faith, he's rewarded with incredible, varied experiences with the Spirit. His prayers are answered. He hears the voice of the Lord. He's rescued by an angel. He's given physical strength to break his bonds. He accomplishes impossible things. He's blessed, nourished, happy. His life illustrates the principle that I love taught in Doctrine and Covenants 50 verse 23. That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. As Nephi responds to his challenges with faith and obedience and gratitude, God gives him more and more light. By the end of his record, you see just how close that he's gotten to God and how much light is in Nephi's life. Laman, on the other hand, goes in the exact opposite direction. It's interesting to note that Laman experiences everything that Nephi does. Laman does end up obeying, basically, the commands of the Lord. Does he leave Jerusalem? Yes. Does he go back for the plates? Yes. Does he help build a boat? Yes. Does he travel to the promised land? Yes. Laman ends up doing everything that Nephi does. So why do they end up in such different places by the end? It's the attitude. It's in how he obeys, with murmuring and reluctance, while Nephi obeys with faith and gratitude. The truth then, when God asks me to do hard things, if I obey with an attitude of faith and gratitude, God will reward me. If I obey with an attitude of murmuring and rebellion, I will be rebuked. So taking it to heart, how do we obey? Do we go to church or seminary, but with a terrible attitude? Do we pay our tithing, but with a grumble under our breath? Do we fulfill our callings, but just at the bare minimum and with a bad attitude? That's a lame man attitude or a layman attitude. We don't want to have one of those. And let's take a quick look at those rebukes. Do you notice anything interesting about the order of rebukes here? Rebuked by his father, rebuked by his younger brother, rebuked by an angel, rebuked by a woman's pleadings, rebuked by the Lord himself, rebuked with a physical shock, rebuked by a threat to his life. They increase in intensity and seriousness, don't they? It's like God has a big wall of rebukes that he can choose from. And as he goes down the line, they get stronger and bigger each time. And at first, a rebuke from his father is all he needed to be straightened out. But then a rebuke from his younger brother is even harder to swallow. And then I really think the order of the next two is interesting. He's rebuked by an angel, and then the pleadings of Miss Nephi are what works next. Maybe that suggests that a woman's tears and pleadings are very, very powerful. Maybe even more powerful than an angel. Women, don't forget the great power and influence that you have 
to help others to do good. In some ways, you're more powerful than angels. Then the Lord rebukes him. And then Laman is shocked physically. And then finally, it's really interesting to look at what happens as they're in the storm on the ship. All the former things don't work anymore. They're too hardened by this point. Lehi and Nephi's pleadings do nothing. The pleadings of Nephi's wife and children have no effect. The only thing that wakes them up is the threat of death. As Nephi has become closer and closer to God, Laman has removed himself further and further from him. Nephi's rise in spirituality as compared to Laman's demise in spirituality. I think it might be good to stop here and, and ask why God rebukes Laman. Because he hates him? Wants to punish him for his bad behavior? Now, God loves Laman. He's hoping that these chastisements are going to help to change his heart, turn him around for good. Like it says in Doctrine and Covenants 95, 1 through 2, And whom I love, I also chasten, that their sins may be forgiven. For with the chastisement, I prepare a way for their deliverance, in all things out of temptation. And I have loved you, wherefore you must needs be chastened and stand rebuked before my face. Rebukes and chastisement open a way for us to be forgiven. God just can't afford to be dismissive or permissive with us. And he wants what's best. He knows that Laman is capable of better, that he has a greater potential. He's like, Laman, if you don't wake up soon, you're going to end up at the end of a road that you don't want to be on, the road that leads to spiritual death. I don't want you to die. So let me try to help you. Unfortunately, in Laman's case, it works for a little while, but eventually he slips back into his old ways. And when Lehi dies, Laman's back to his old tricks again. It's as if God reaches out for the next rebuke and finds there's nothing there. He's used all of them. He's tried everything. So now there's nothing left to do but resign him to his lot. And they're cut off from his presence. I hope that we never find ourselves at the end of that road. So to conclude, for an I will go and do activity, what are you going to take away from this lesson? There was so much to digest here. Which of the following truths did you most need today and why? Ponder that. I might invite my students to write their answer to that question in their journals. And, and the different lessons that they could choose from, Apathy towards the things of God is a spiritually dangerous attitude. If God asks me to do something, no matter how hard, I can do it, even the impossible. When seeking to obey God's commands, I should expect challenge and opposition. Willing obedience equals reward and nearness to God. Reluctant obedience equals rebuke and separation from God. And then, Godly rebukes open the way to forgiveness. If I respond positively to them, they will lead me back to Him. If I continually reject them, eventually I will be cut off from His presence. Something that President Nelson recently said in his excellent talk entitled Think Celestial that applies well here. He said, When you make choices, I invite you to take the long view, an eternal view, Put Jesus Christ first because your eternal life is dependent upon your faith in Him and in His atonement. It is also dependent upon your obedience to His laws. Obedience paves the way for a joyful life for you today and a grand eternal reward tomorrow. The suggested video that you could show to underscore this principle would be this one entitled Blessed and happy are those who keep the commandments of God. And ask, why does God want us to follow his commandments? Therefore, I pray that we will pack faith to obey in our spiritual backpacks as well. It has an object to represent this attitude. I might pull out a Nike shoe and place it in my backpack. Why? Just do it is the slogan, right? 
It's wise for us to pack a just do it kind of attitude when God asks us to do hard things. When, when challenges arise, that was Nephi's attitude. Remember that we can choose rewards or rebukes on our journey towards our promised land, depending on our attitude towards God's commands. So there you have it, my friends, three great principles that will help us on our journey to our promised land. Personal revelation, the scriptures, and faith to obey God's commands. If we pack those three things in our backpacks, then one day I believe we'll make it. We will get to our desired destination. And that will conclude our lessons for today, my friends. I hope that was helpful to you in some way. And if it was, then I hope that you will share this channel or this lesson with somebody else that you feel it can help. Thank you so much for taking this time to study with me. Now get out there and teach with us.